Okay, so now some uh, specifics, and uh, the first talk will be by Dr. Danjing Wang. She is a, um, a faculty in the Center for Pharmacogenomics, and um, she, she has come from UCSF with the group uh, after um, leaving China a long time ago. And she has emerged now into a real expert in the area of um, genomics, functional genetics, and she is exploiting the new concepts of the chromatin remodeling and the chromatin structure and the regulome, if you wish, that it's dependent upon genetic variants as well as environmental, uh, environmental uh, interactions. So when the chromatin remodels, you have a SNP and an enhancer. That site opens up or closes more because of that variant. And then the uh, environmental impact comes in, it changes the conformation of the structure by epigenetic changes. So there's this nexus between genetics and epigenetics, and if we don't understand that, we will not uh, be able to uh, get forward. Danjing. Okay, thank you for your introduction, Wolfgang. And then so today I'm going to talk about the SIP enzyme, the cytochrome, the SIP 3A, 3A regulum. So SIP is stands for the cytochrome P450s. The cytochrome P450 is the most important phase one enzyme. It metabolized of about 70% of currently used drugs. All these SIP enzymes are highly variable in expression and activity with strong genetic components. That means that this uh, variability is majorly de depend on the genetic factors. And the early studies, and also Wolfgang is the part of the co-author of this paper, early studies demonstrate that the polymorphic drug metabolizing enzymes is the major cause of adverse drug reactions. And this paper is published in 2001, it's over 10 years ago. And more recently, a prospective clinical trial demonstrate that pharmacogenomics testing guided treatment for a psychiatric patient can save over hundreds, over thousand dollars each year per person. And this is just published at the end of last year. All this demonstrate that this genetic polymorphism exhibit enzyme has the identified this, and this variant has the promise to, to uh, for the more precise drug treatment to reduce the side effect, also reduce the medication cost and increase the efficacy. And um, some of the uh, this SIP enzyme has been used as the biomarker for in FDA table for ph of pharmacogenomics biomarker in drug labeling of all these 166 drugs. FDA approved drugs with pharmacogenomic information in drug labeling, over one third of it are the biomarker are SIP enzymes. Let this also highlight the, ident the SIP enzyme polymorphism could be a useful biomarker to predicting drug, react drug effect. But, uh, but the, the even uh, uh, has been studied over several decades that polymorphism in the SIP enzyme is still not very clear. Human has over 50 SIP enzymes, but only about 10 of these SIP enzymes involved in drug metabolism. Of here, we can see here the uh, 3A family is the most abundant in the liver, and also the major one member in 3A family is 3A4. It involved in the metabolized most of the, most, uh, uh, most of the drugs. It's about nearly 50% of currently used drugs are metabolized by CYP3A4. And this CYP3A4 is known to be very variable. The inter-individual variability by in vivo enzyme activity can vary from seven to 20 fold. And twin studies suggest that this, the, the heritability of this variability is over 60. 60%. So that indicate that genetics, the variability of 3A4 is majorly caused by genetic factors. But how much we know about the genetics of 3A4? In, uh, in six acting polymorphism, that is polymorphism inside the gene locus, in the coding region of the 3A4, it's very low. 
using the allele frequency about less than 1%, in some population may be up to 2%. It cannot explain large portion of the variability in 3A4. And a couple of years ago, we identified a regulatory variant in 3A4 now designated as the start 22. This variant now it, it's known to be the most clinical relevant polymorphism uh, predicting 3A4 activity. It has been associated with the many drugs uh, metabolized by 3A4. But because this variant also has a low allele frequency, it's about 4 to 5 percent minor allele frequency, it still it cannot explain majority of the variability in 3A4. Other mechanism has been explored, like a transacting polymorphism that identify polymorphism in transcription factor that affect the uh, regulate the C3A4 expression. This has been explored, but everyone it only explain very small portion of the uh, variability. Other like epigenetic microRNA has been explored, but no one is very clear. So. In spite of the over several decades extensive study of CYP3A4, the genetics of CYP3A4 still remains largely, largely unknown. So recent advances in the genomic study in, uh, has indicated the, the, complex, the complex gene regulation. The regulatory elements is not necessary, has to be seeked close to the, its target gene. It can be anywhere in the genome, and then we know that the genome is not flat. It's even not also not nonlinear, and its genome is organized in in a three-dimensional organization. And the regulatory elements can be far away from its target gene and interact with the target gene promoter by looping interaction. Even it, it can separate by multiple other genes, and then trans acting factors like transcription factor, epigenetic modification, and then genetic variant all can shape this different three-dimensional three organization of the genome and affecting this looping interaction. All of these six acting, trans-acting, epigenetic, genetic variant, all these and their interaction together, we call it as a regulon. That is, the uh, regulon is all together regulate the gene expression. So to understand, to identify the genetic variant and fully understand the regulation, we need to dissect this regulon. For 3A4 regulon, first in the first layer, we dissect in the six acting level. And now there are a lot of genomic approaches available to, to look into the different uh, area of this uh, six acting uh, level. For to, uh, to identify the what region talk to 3A4 promoter? We use this in the chromatin conformation capture analysis. There are several versions of this analysis available, but for, for a focused region, we use this 4C assay to, to identify what region talk to the 3A4 promoter. Anything is talked to it has the promise to be a regulatory element. Then to identify their function, we use this CRISPR case 9 mediated genome editing approach. In the living cell to modify the genome, we're using the deletion to we delete the suspected region and see what happened to the gene expression change. This to, to, uh, it, it's a useful tool to assign the function of each region, each region. And also the other common method like uh, chip seq assay to identify the transcription factor binding and epigenetic modification. Using all of these approaches, this is shows the result for the 3A locus. In 3A, 3A this locus, it contains four genes. And we identify four regions. All these regions span, span over 200 KB. We identify four regions, that is, the interact with 3A4 promoter. And using CRISPR knockout of each region, we see the expression profile change for not just for 3A4, but also for other genes. And, and uh, in, in the summary on the, this side, we see that one regulatory element can activate, can regulate multiple target genes. And every target genes, it can be regulated by multiple regulatory elements. So in, in this different 
four regulatory elements we screen for all the polymorphisms, and we identified a haplotype, several haplotypes and SNPs that can regulate not just 3A4 expression, but also for other 3A5, 3A other genes expression. And then this, this it's not a single variant, but it, it's, a, it's a haplotype. So that all of this, if you, uh, without the detailed study of this genome architecture, we cannot identify it because all this is regulated each one interaction with each other. You cannot easily uh, identify but by just association studies. And then the second level, we look at the transacting factors, that is, the transcription factor. Uh, because the CYP3A4 is only expressed in the liver and the intestine, so therefore, this 45, there are 45 liver enriched transcription factor. All these factor has the, has the potential to regulate 3A4 expression. Earlier study using the linear regression model to see the correlation expression of 3A4 and this transcription factor have already identified some transcription factor appears to be correlated with the 3A4 expression. But polymorphism in that transcription factor only only can expand very small of variability in 3A4. So we consider that this, the, the regulation of this 3A4 is not by single transcription factor, but by the it's a complex, high order, higher order, long linear regulatory network. All gene, they all work together to regulate 3A4 uh, expression. So it's not all of this higher order, non linear regulatory network. Uh, it cannot be detected by the regular uh, linear regression. So we now we collaborate. We collaborate with the, uh, we're using collaborate with Dr. Greg Rapala in the bio, Mathematical Bioscience Institute in OSU to use the mathematical approach. It called the SOBO decomposition to dissect this gene regulatory re, uh, network and using existing RNA seq and microarray data. This then the approach, this mathematical approach, able to to find the uh, the, the key, the regulator, and also their interaction all together uh, can explain higher. We already even now it's still it's still running that uh, it's still running, but uh, we already see that some uh, factors is not reported before, and the interaction of several factors can explain. <coughs> significant portion of the 3A4 variability. The goal of this is to identify major factors and their interaction for 3A expression. And after that, we can identify the polymorphism in these key factors and their interaction. We expect to expand more and combine with six acting factors. We expect to be, can expand majority large portion of 3A variability and could be a very useful biomarker to predict 3A activity. And this 3A4 it metabolized over 50% of the currently used drugs. So we have one goal is to identify genetic biomarker for precise the drug therapy. So next acknowledgement is for this our group and Wolfgang Sadi acknowledged him for his consistent support. And here you see the Greg Lopala. And his uh, uh, his great PhD student Ron Lu and his collaborator Caleb in Princeton University, they are running this the sober decomposition. And RGPAD you see here is our uh, run this uh, sequencing facility for all this next generation sequencing. And also the uh, Kate Beth and the John Flather. Now Beth is a postdoc, and Kate and John is this graduate student, MD, PhD student. Now, they can they help all this, download all this big data, GTEx data, microarray data, and also manage all this data, GYS data, and also educate other people how to use this data. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks much, uh, Danjing. So we decided uh, we will have three brief presentations on the discussion uh, at the end of this. So the, um, uh, Danjing just mentioned that uh, Kate um, uh, Hartman and Beth have uh, downloaded all these um, GWAS and so on. So she, uh, Beth will give you an example. She is a postdoc, came out of our group, and uh, 
Um, and now, together with Kate is managing these databases, and we're adding new um, investigators. Um, Kate had written a, um, a um, IRB, a Morella IRB, that makes it easier to get this, otherwise it takes half a year. So just a new faculty member in psychology, um, Yang An had just downloaded 10 new uh, GWAS in, in the addiction area, and that's now accessible. So um, this is really an ex incredibly val uh, valuable resource. And uh, uh, Beth, you're on. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to be discussing uh, functional genomics and its application to complex disorders. And so our approach to this challenge is to integrate these different large data sets, as Wolfgang mentioned, in order to define regulatory genetic variants and then apply these to human disease. So in, for this presentation, I'll just be discussing two examples, dopamine beta hydroxylase and the nicotinic receptor gene cluster. So we selected to study DBH, dopamine beta hydroxylase, because um, very, levels of this vary widely between individuals, and there, it's been known that there's a strong genetic component to this. Now, DBH has an important role um, throughout the body because it's the enzyme that converts dopamine to norepinephrine. It's been widely studied in the context of neurocognitive disorders, but um, largely been ignored in the periphery. But um, its action centrally is largely independent of what's happening in the periphery since dopamine and norepinephrine cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. So we wanted to dig into um, its action in the periphery. And I've highlighted here some of the tissue, the human tissues we selected to study since they receive sympathetic innervation. Um, and there are a variety of potential implications for complex disorders, as we can see a number of organs that could be affected, including heart for cardiovascular disease or the lung um, for asthma. And so um, in our lab, we measured levels of mRNA expression, and as expected, we saw significant DBH expression in, in the locus ceruleus in the brain, as well as in the adrenal gland, which had been previously reported to um, be the main source of DBH for the body. But surprisingly, we also found high expression in the liver, which had not previously been reported, and the initial finding was uh, disputed. And so um, we were then able to harness a new database called GTEx. This is the Genotype Tissue Expression Database, which has over 700 uh, subjects, and in, it surveys RNA expression in um, 54 different tissue types. And so we were able to use this data to study our st specific gene of interest across this range of tissues. And luckily, um, again, we saw that there was significant DBH expression in the adrenal gland, but also here in the liver, supporting what we had um, already found in the lab. And so then we wanted to see if there was gen were genetic variants that contributed to uh, modulating these levels of RNA expression in the liver. And we identified two single nucleotide polymorphisms that acted to lower mRNA expression in the liver. And we saw a combined effect. So individuals who were homozygous for the minor allele of each of these two SNPs had the lowest overall DBH expression, whereas um, subjects who were homozygous for the major allele for both of the SNPs had overall the highest expression. And so this series of experiments took several months uh, to establish, but um, actually using the GTEx resource, we were able to validate these findings in a matter of minutes. And so um, these data sets give us a new ability to um, accelerate the rate of discovery um, for these important these important genes. And so using this data, we had con now confirmed that we had identified two genetic variants that affected mRNA expressions in the liver, but now the next question is, how is this important clinically? What, is, what kind of impact could this have? And so to answer this question, we collaborated with Marilyn Ritchie and Sarah Pendergrass at Penn State to perform some FIWAS studies. And so these are phenome-wide association studies testing specific genetic variants of interest and their association with a wide range of phenotypes. And we identified these different phenotypes using ICD-9 codes from electronic medical records. 
And so in our initial analysis, we identified an, significant associations for each SNP individually with angina. And then this effect, again, replicated in a second cohort in a targeted analysis. We also tested for an interactive effect, so not looking at an additive, but testing this epistatic interaction between the two SNPs and found a significant association with myocardial infarction, both in the initial Marshfield study as well as in a follow-up study in the Geisinger cohort. And what was really interesting is that this also replicated in a third study, the Jackson Heart Study, which was composed of all African Americans. So we're seeing this effect repl replicate across racial groups as well. And the other thing that I should mention is this is a protective effect. So we're seeing that these are actually not risk alleles. They are um, showing protective offense, effects against these cardiac events. And so this can be um, considered to, we can consider these to apply them to um, predicting risk or protection against cardiac events, but also potentially for dosing um, medications such as beta blockers. And I didn't have time to show today, but we also um, saw some effects in lung tissue with these SNPs having an effect on RNA expression levels. And we also saw some phenotype uh, associations with asthma. So there's another potential application of, of these variants. And so I'm just I'm discussing a few of the studies that I looked at for um, the DBH study, but um, together with Kate Hartman, uh, we, as Wolfgang mentioned, um, compiled an umbrella IRB protocol to access these data sets um, through NIH, the dbGaP website. And so we have um, 27 different studies here for a total of almost 300,000 different subjects with a variety of different diseases that, um, with the potential to study. And the, a new investigator, Young An, has focused on um, accessing databases focusing on drug addiction. And so um, we have a variety of data sets we're able to tap into. And the goal would eventually be to develop this as a resource for the medical center through the Center for uh, Precision Medicine. Um, and so I'm going to give one other example to, of using these in silico functional genomics tools um, to study the nicotinic gene locus. And so, well, there are a wide variety of um, things we can look at, but we need to integrate all of these different factors together in order to really understand the regulation of this cluster. And so specifically, we're interested in looking at the nicotinic alpha-5, alpha-3, and beta-4 genes. They're all um, located together here um, on chromosome 15, but we also wanted to determine whether other genes in the region were important as well, and so we selected a 500 kV window for our, our searches. And basically, our goal is to define the regulome um, in this region using bioinformatics tools. And so I'm just going to give you a few small pieces as examples, but um, first thing that we wanted to know was, are these genes independent from one another, or are they co-expressed? And so um, this is just giving one example of alpha-3 alpha expression in the adrenal gland. And so we saw different patterns with different genes in different tissues, but again, this is just one example. And what we saw here is that there was an association between alpha-3 expression and alpha-5 expression, and a very strong association between alpha-3 and beta-4 expression. So both of these genes would be important to consider together in conjunction with alpha-3. What was also interesting is that we found an association with a non-coding RNA that had previously not been addressed in the literature. So again, this would be important to include in our analysis. The other important piece to take away from this is that um, there is not a significant association with other protein coding genes or other non-coding genes in the region. And so, in, at least in the context of this tissue, we ab were able to isolate which genes are important because they're being co-expressed with um, this gene of interest. Another thing that we can look at are expression quantitative trait loci, or EQTLs. And what this is looking at is the association of a single genetic variant with mRNA expression of that gene. And so here we see individual SNPs and their um, associations, this is a minus log p-value, with the expression of alpha-3. And what you can see here are a few things. First is that there are tissue-specific differences. So we see here that there is a single haplotype that is affecting um, expression in the brain um, and in a variety of different brain regions indicated both with the red and the blue and the green dots here. 
But then we also see a second region of interest um, present in skeletal muscle that doesn't seem to have the same effect as in the brain. And the other thing that's interesting about um, this signal is that uh, even though it's affecting alpha-3 expression, it's not located in the the next gene, and it's not located in alpha-5, but it's even up further upstream. So um, these SNPs that are significant, very, very significantly associating with alpha-3 expression are actually over 80,000 bases away from the alpha-3 gene itself. And so something else that we need to keep in mind is that we need to be looking um, in a much broader region than previously we had, um, we had expected. And so um, this is kind of a complicated slide, but um, what we're trying to do here is pull together all of these different pieces of evidence and overlay them to define our candidate variants that are having an impact. And then um, we can take those haplotypes that we create, selecting different um, SNPs that are having an impact, and then apply that to, to disease. And so what this plot is here is showing the different colors are showing the linkage disequilibrium between the different SNPs. So red means that um, the SNPs are not in linkage, so they're not likely to appear with the other SNP, whereas white means when you see one SNP, you're almost always going to see the other SNP as well. And so um, what these squares are showing us is that um, we can likely pick out one SNP from this whole block that will account for the other SNPs in the region. And so we can select, um, you know, about eight SNPs from this, this long list that we can then use um, to apply to different diseases. And the different symbols here are showing the different levels of evidence that suggest that this SNP could potentially be functional. So there are a lot of resources that are available and um, while it's a different transition um, doing experiments versus accessing these databases, I think it's an, an important advance um, and we have a great resource here that we'd be happy to, to share with anyone who'd be interested in collaborating. So um, I'd like to thank the group here as well as the group at Penn State and our other collaborators. Thank you. Yeah, so th that was a, um, a, an example as to how we can use these uh, databases and we want to expand this and we're in negotiations with the Dean's office and so on too. Um, also, um, this data acquisition now has become really a, a group effort. So several people go together and some of the other graduate students and like John Freiter and um, or Song Ha Lee, who, uh, who has done some of the EQTL plots, they all work together, and um, the rate of discovery is really uh, quite good. So, um, next talk will be by Susan Ware. Bear? Is she here? Oh, there, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so, uh, Susan Ware is. Um, the co-director of the program for personalized medicine and pharmacogenomics um, at Nationwide and Heme Onc. And so she, will, she has done pharmacogenetics work in the past, and she's now also interested in AML in her publications. And um, please go ahead. So thank you for inviting me to come uh, join you all today. Um, I am going to give you a very broad overview of this topic. Um, I could probably speak for about four hours on each of these things, so I hope I can represent sort of the unique challenges that we have um, in pediatrics uh, in these areas. So as uh, Dr. Hirschberg already discussed, as physicians, we already inherently practice personalized medicine and precision medicine, um, especially in pediatrics. Um, we consider things like developmental stage, uh, when choosing drugs for our patients, um, from renal maturation to just simple ability to swallow tablets versus liquids. Um, we base our doses on weight, we base it on age, we base it on body surface area. Um, so as, as pediatricians, we're already uh, very accustomed to personalizing our therapies. Um, but we do have unique challenges uh, compared to adults in seeking further personalization for our patients. Fortunately, there are fewer patients in pediatrics than there are in uh, adult medicine. 
We have, um, in my field, hematology oncology, we certainly have fewer uh, patients experiencing cancer diagnoses, which is a good thing, but also can make uh, research a little bit more challenging in terms of sample size. Um, we also have some variability in the maturation of drug metabolizing enzymes, which I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, um, and that term is ontogeny. Um, and then there are actually clinically very few drug genome interactions that we use in clinical practice. So the only drug genome interaction we routinely use is looking at TPMT um, uh, enzyme genotype um, for azathioprine. So 6-mercaptopurine um, and 6-thiaguanine are two drugs very commonly used in the treatment of acute lymph uh, lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, and we routinely send genetic testing um, some centers use uh, more of a phenotypic testing for the enzyme level, um, and we actually use that genotype or phenotype to uh, adjust drug dosing up front, so before the patient uh, ever takes one of those drugs, knowing that uh, some of the variants that we see result in decreased enzyme production and thus uh, need for a lower dose to start with in order to prevent uh, significant myelosuppression. Uh, we also have fewer patients actually taking these drugs, um, and so it's a little more difficult to say, uh, you know, we, we see about 40 to 45 new leukemia diagnoses a year, um, which so you can imagine that uh, collecting enough patients at a single center can be difficult in order to create a significant result out of a study. Um, and then you can't simply extrapolate adult data to pediatrics. If you've ever heard any sort of pediatric talk, you may have heard uh, uh, children are not just little adults. Um, we have to make dosing change recommendations uh, based on weight and body surface area. And then again, the consideration of ontogeny exists. So in terms of the effect of development on drug metabolizing enzymes, uh, we do see a postnatal surge of most of the hepatic enzymes, especially the cytochrome P450 enzymes. Um, but the level of the initial surge and the rate of increase toward adult levels varies. And in some cases, at times in development, uh, the level of the enzyme can actually surpass adult levels. Um, so in specifically in the cytochrome P450 enzymes, which Dr. Wang uh, generously has introduced for me, um, we see a transition from CYP3A7 to CYP3A4 expression in the very first months of life. Um, this is possibly, in recent studies, um, we see that it's possibly due to changes in methylation and other epigenetic factors. So once again, slide where I was. So now that everyone's awake, um, so we were discussing uh, that our cytochrome P450 enzymes, uh, we see this transition in the first few months of life. Um, interestingly, um, Developmental changes, much like expression of the enzymes, can be organ-specific. Um, and there was this recent publication in Toxicology looking at uh, mRNA expression um, for two uh, drug metabolizing enzymes, so human carboxyl esterase 2, um, as well as CYP3A4. Um, looking at it in tissue samples from over 100 patients um, ranging in age from one day of life all the way up into adult. Um, and so you can see the top um, two figures are from the liver um, tissue expression. On the left is our carboxyl esterase mRNA expression, and on the right is CYP3A4. Um, and you can see um, one, two, three, and four um, all represent uh, the neonatal period. And so you can see that simply in the neonatal period, um, there is a significant difference in expression um, both in the liver and the, um, in the liver for both enzymes. Um, and there's a significant difference in expression as well between all of the pediatric phases um, for the carboxylesterase expression and the adult um, expression. Then looking in the duodenum, um, there is not actually as much of a differential um, for um, the CYP3A4 expression as you can see on the right. Um, in this one, the uh, one, two, and three are all the neonatal periods, um, and then four is the over 18 um, here on, on the right. Um, there is, however, differential expression of the carboxylesterase mRNA in the duodenum between um, this zero to 70 days of life, 76 to 140, and um, the 163 to just under a year of age. Um, but then um, significantly, um, there is not um, a significant difference in expression in the adult population. So there is a difference um, just in the tissue expression, which obviously can make this even more complicated. Um, so I'll briefly talk about um, 
my uh, my project in Warfarin, um, which is now a fairly well known story. But um, so uh, Warfarin, uh, one of our most popularly used anticoagulants, uh, actually has two enantiomers: the R and S Warfarin. Um, S Warfarin being the more active metabolite or active enantiomer. Um, so S Warfarin inhibits VCOR C1, which is an enzyme that takes our um, vitamin K from oxidized to reduced, um, resulting ultimately in activated factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 protein CNS, thus resulting in anticoagulation. Um, and so VCOR C1 um, is the, one of the important enzymes, as well as um, another cytochrome P450 enzyme, CYP2C9, um, which takes S warfarin from um, active to inactive at 7 hydroxy warfarin. Um, so, as you might imagine, and then CYP4F2 um, has been demonstrated in some studies also to be a, a factor. Um, so, as you might imagine, there are um, genetic changes in especially VCOR C1 and CYP2C9 that can affect the dose required um, in adult populations um, for active warfarin, um, therapeutic warfarin levels. Um, when I began my project, there were no pediatric studies. By the time I finished, there were two published in blood. But um, I did uh, have 100 patients um, between clinical and database uh, resources, biobank bio resources, um, and saw very similar results as to what we were seeing in the adult population. So patients um, with the wild type. So in vcor C1, wild type uh, is BB for reasons I have no control over. Um, so wild type uh, dose requirement here is at the one level. And you can see there's a significant difference between patients with homozygous variant and wild type and dose requirement. So patients with variants require less dose, um, less quantity of warfarin to reach therapeutic levels. Um, similarly, in CYP2C9, patients with a uh, variant of any kind um, required a significantly less dose um, than our wild type patients. That has yet to come into clinical practice in pediatrics, although in adults it is, uh, it is used. <laughs> um, switching now to precision and targeted therapies from our pharmacogenomics. Um, so we have the same challenge. We have fewer patients. Um, fortunately, fewer patients uh, get cancer. Um, there are also fewer targets in pediatric tumors. Um, interestingly, there have been multiple studies looking at somatic alterations, um, genetic alterations in tumors, um, and, and there simply seem to be fewer targeted therapies. Um, and even when targets are defined um, or identified, there are fewer clinical trials with available therapy, whether that's um, due to um, drug development rules and regulations, um, availability of actual data on dose requirements for pediatrics versus adults. Um, we have had some notable successes um, in terms of targeted therapy for our cancer patients. So anti-GD2 um, chimeric antibodies in neuroblastoma, as well as MIBG therapy um, in neuroblastoma, both uh, identify specific features of the tumor to target. Um, imatinib and its um, successors in CML, as well as um, Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL. Um, Brentuximab, which is an anti-CD30 antibody in ALCL. Um, and then uh, most recently, uh, CAR T cell, so chimeric um, antigen receptor T cell, um, T cells which target CD19 for our ALL patients. And we're working toward uh, more, uh, more targets using that same mechanism. Um, our experience uh, regarding tumor genomic profiling and selection of a targeted therapy for some of our patients, um, we've been sending uh, tumor profiling to Foundation One um, for some time and recently are, are changing that a little bit. But um, previously, over the over 17 months um, that we were looking at this, we sent four hematologic malignancy samples and 12 solid tumor samples, all in our relapsed and refractory patients. Um, so. I think the most interesting thing um, about this slide, we had one patient with rhabdomyosarcoma, which is known to have some um, genetic alterations, somatic genetic alterations associated with it. Um, but aside from this one patient who had over six um, pathogenic variants identified, um, every other patient had less than four pathogenic variants, and the majority of variants identified were all these variants of unknown significance, meaning we didn't really have anything to say about them in terms of use, utility in clinical practice. Um, 
which raises again the issue that we need more data and more information on, um, on these patients. Um, amongst these patients we tested, there were seven open clinical trials corresponding to the variants we identified, three of which involved FDA-approved therapy globally, as in, in adults. Um, but none of these patients were able to participate in clinical trials because none of them were actually open to pediatric patients. There was one therapeutic intervention done as a result of testing, um, which, in which we used a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor for a CDK4 amplification, but there was no therapeutic benefit seen in that one patient. Um, four patients have pathogenic abnormalities concerning for a possible germline mutation, um, indicating a possible cancer predisposition. Two have actually undergone germline testing, and there was one confirmed and one negative um, germline test, indicating also that you have to be uh, a little careful when interpreting these somatic mutations in light of the germline. So, um, noting that we were doing these sort of as a one-off clinical utility basis, I started looking for a way to, um, to do this in a more systematic, research-oriented fashion. Um, and to that end, we are now a part of the GAIN consortium, um, GAIN standing for Genomic Assessment and Forms Novel Therapy. Um, if you have any familiarity with pediatric genomic Profiling of tumors, this is an extension of the ICAT-1 study out of Boston. Um, in talks, we often call it just ICAT-2. Um, but this is looking at determining a standard for clinical genomics assays and interpretation for clinical use in pediatric uh, oncology patients, as well as um, conducting clinical genomic studies in pediatric solid tumors um, that build on our experience um, from that ICAT-1 study, um, and looking at how that actually impacts our approach and clinical outcomes. There are currently five patients enrolled at the primary site, Dana-Farber. Testing is underway. Um, there are currently 12 total sites, and the goal is to recruit 825 patients over the course of three years. Um, we are not yet activated at Children's. Uh, we're waiting for the first group of patients to go all the way through um, enrollment, testing, curation, uh, return of results um, until those patients are, uh, until the other sites are activated. Um, in addition, there is also um, a children's oncology group, NCI collaborative um, match trial in the works. Um, there is, you know, the NCI match uh, looking at matching um, molecular changes in tumors to therapy choice in adults. Um, and the COG is collaborating with the NCI to create a pediatric version of this. Um, so the eligibility for um, these patients will be recurrent in solid tumors and lymphomas. The GAIN consortium is actually looking at any high-risk tumor, even up front, um, with the goal of collecting samples, both at the time of diagnosis and the time of relapse, to do some comparative studies. Um, so this is slated to start sometime in 2016. Um, if you've ever experienced COG timing, you know that that, who knows. Um, but the plan is to do um, relapsed refractory solid tumors, look at a biopsy, look at genetic sequencing, identify actionable mutations, um, and then move on to matching study agents if possible. Um, and that is what I tried to pack in, so. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So, maybe uh, you could come up and uh, sit comfortably in the fund. <laughs> and I hope there are some questions uh, from the audience, and uh, uh, please go ahead. Um, well, let me just jump start this. So we have very uh, different topics. Uh, we will go into the cancer area further, but I, I'm very happy to see that uh, you're starting these studies. Um, I also would make, like to make a comment on um, Beth talking about DBH. We really didn't want to study the periphery, we wanted to study the effect of DBH and the CNS because many of the GWAS associations were with uh, clinical phenotypes that are CNS related. And uh, we're actually, uh, the idea was that this was in, in the adrenals and in the brain where the variants would uh, be active and they weren't active there. They were only active in sympathetic neurons. And that forced Beth to do the study in this way. And it brings me to an important point that if we study a gene and we just look at one organ, I think we're just not exactly grasping of what's going on. With the gene cluster, the alpha uh, 3, alpha 4 um, uh, uh, 
yeah, alpha-3, alpha-5, beta-4, it's a target for addiction treatment. Now, there are new agents out that actually uh, treat addictions in all kinds of varieties, but as you could see, it's a, these genes are expressed everywhere, and they are very uh, strongly associated, for instance, with lung cancer, alpha-5, which is very highly expressed in some lung tumors. And so, uh, the, uh, also, uh, the connection between the periphery and the central system is not, there's not this immutable barrier in between, uh, where you know, some compounds may not be able to go through, but there are nerve connections, so it's all connected in a way. Um, please uh, go ahead and ask some more questions. Yeah. I Alex. had a question about the, the CYP3A4 story, which I thought was really interesting, and I, I, I was just curious about the notion that um, some of these variants that are now clearly established to be connected to multiple drug phenotypes are still not being prospectively implemented to guide dosing. You know, for example, the, the CYP3A4 start 22 allele. I mean, well, do you have any idea about the hurdles that are, you know, preventing this from being, you know, prospectively implemented in, in routine care? Uh, for the CYP enzyme, I think that some of it is already being used in the clinical, like the CYP2C9 for offering and 2C19 for clopidogrel. I think some company or biomarker, some company there yeah. have this biomarker test available. But for the 3A4, three, uh, three, uh, three start 22, I think some people are also using and in, uh, it already included in some biomarker test panel. But for the, the question why it's not commonly publicly or uh, very commonly used, I think that depends on the clinician, whether they want to prescribe this test. And also the other issues, probably in the cost of the reimbursement, something, other things. That it's always the physician in it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had one, one other question, which is, um, I mean, that, that's just, you know, out of curiosity, I, I've seen this information many times that, you know, uh, genetics contributes to 80% of variation in CYP3A4. And that's usually based on data from twin studies, as you say. But is, can, you, can you actually claim that that percentage is this high you know, in a general population of patients that walks through the door, knowing you know, the, um, the impact of environment and lifestyle on, on the function of, of this class of enzymes? Yeah, there are different methods to testing this heritability. One is twin study, that, that studying the homo, homo homozygotic twin to see whether because they have the same uh, DNA, all this information, but also have the same environment. The other method to testing the heritability is by, for, in, the, in the case of uh, 3A4, they're using repeat dose, repeat dose administration. In the same individual and in different time, you give a prop drug and the testing its activity over the time. So this also considers the different environment, diet, and also different seasonal changes. And then still, the, the result is still over 60% is the heritable. So I believe that this the genetic factor still is the major cause of its availability. And in, in, our, in our recent study, I think, we, I think probably we identified a haplotype that can determine the different expression of the 3A4 in the six, uh, sixth level. Uh, in the chance acting level, I think there will be more. If combine them together, it's likely we will, can solve this missing heritability issue. I wanted to speak, oh, can I speak uh, to yeah, yeah. Just a question about your, oh, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to answer a little bit about the clinical implementation question. Um, in my previous life, I was at Vanderbilt, which actually was implementing some of that clinical data, or the pharmacogenomics data into the clinical. Um, and the challenge partially is how do you, one, make sure every clinician using those drugs actually understands that there is a pharmacogenomic drug genome interaction concern there. But also once you, even if they send the testing, how do you get that data into the clinical chart in a meaningful way? There are so many drugs that our cytochrome P450 enzymes affect um, and more, you know, more knowledge comes out every day. So how do you take that knowledge and put it into the EMR in a way that actually 
is effective and you know if you go to prescribe a new drug that that um, that enzyme affects then how does a physician who didn't send the testing in the first place going to know how to do it so I think there's lots of systematic barriers and in, in addition to the scientific barriers yeah I just like to add one thing so at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital they get the clinical pharmacists involved and so there's committees that bring these things forward and the clinical pharmacists write the consult so everybody gets uses the same information the same way. We can definitely learn from you because we are behind and Vanderbilt or St. Jude's is far ahead in this. That's an urgent issue. Hilla? Yeah, just to add to that, the primary care internal medicine here uses uh, um, genomic testing a lot, uh, or pharmacogenomic testing, especially for any uh, you know, a lot of the um, antidepressants and CNS drugs. So it's, it, they've built it into their system, which is only the last year. So it's exciting. No, I, I didn't, I was excited about your liver DH study. And what I want to know, and maybe you'll have to help Wolfgang answer this, is um, as you do uh, the pharmacogenomics, it's very interesting to have tissue to back it up, but sometimes you can't always get tissues <laughs> um, that easily. So I, I know you use often the um, uh, peripheral blood uh, cells. Is, would that be useful, or, or how, how can we help with getting tissues? Danjing, uh, or here, whoever wants to answer this. So actually, all, all of our tissues is getting from the, let's say, tissue network, tissue, what they call is the... Cooperative human tissue yeah, network. Co yeah. It's in OSU. OSU has such organization, you can order from them. But it seems it would be better to, if you're doing a study, setting up a trial, to get the tissues on the people that you're actually studying. Right, right. That's okay. what I was talking yeah. about, sort Before, of as we go along in a study. Well, I think very importantly, if you do prospective trials and you have new patients coming in, then getting tissues from those folks will be the best. But um, it is also important to get brain tissue or to get liver tissue or pancreas and so on, and um, that will be rather difficult. So a blood tissue gives you a lot of information, and you can use the blood tissue to then go into GTEx and compare how does this, how does this gene uh, behave in the blood tissue compared to the target tissue, and that gives you some inferences. But um, to collect prospectively, we were talking about using GWAS and then going into GTEx and then co correlating this. That's all done on the fly. Prospective trials are still the gold standard but they take a long time, and we must do them also, and they have different criteria, you know. Well, and also to that point, though, and so w when we're looking in the brain and studying brain, t and that's not something that you can collect on, on living patients, so, um, but that's why we're, attempt we're doing these studies and then potentially identifying um, genetic variants that then you could test in blood samples. And so we're using the tissues of interest, studying the RNA expression since it does differ between tissues, but then we can translate what we find at the RNA level in these specific tissues um, to specific variants that then you can measure in blood or saliva or easily an obtainable tissue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this question is, uh, Oops, thank you. This question is for, for Beth. So. You mentioned doing the FIWAS studies, and you had uh, information, you know, you used the databases from uh, Geisinger and Marshfield and uh, Jackson Hart. So do you guys have data use agreements in place to work with them, or, or, or is that something that the center will help to bridge that, or how will that work? That's definitely a, a complicated issue. So yes, there is a lot of paperwork involved in gaining access to these data sets, and, um, but that would be a goal for the Center for Precision Medicine, is that there would be an administrative person in charge of that. Um, right now it's being managed mostly by Kate Hartman. Um, I feel guilty about that. And um, <laughs> we also have um, Mandy Curtis is being involved. So we have a couple people who are managing this, but yes, there are data use agreements, there are um, material transfer agreements. It depends on the route of um, how we're accessing the study. If we directly access it through the parent study, there's more paperwork. But if we access it through DBGAP, through the NIH, that's a more streamlined process. Okay. And or what? you collaborate on Mel and Richie really did some of the analysis. So she has access. That's her raison d'etre, so she is uh, 
extracting this uh, FIWAS approach now is, is one that is coming to the fore. Many people are very skeptical about this because the electronic medical records have a lot of error in there and people are, oh, there's too much noise. Big data lives on noise uh, analysis, right? And so um, uh, having this access for her, then you can ask for any gene or for anything, uh, which phenotype is involved or in what population and so on is pretty powerful. And it gives you guides only and you have to replicate. So you have to access the multiple trials and so on. Sure, sure. And one other question, the, the gtex.org, so what kind of information is actually, do they tap into there? What, what, type of, what types of data, what types of data, databases do they have? Things like proteomics too that they get into or? Um, so there's a variety of different things. Um, so there's the, G, on gtex.org, it's um, a pretty accessible browser with, you don't really need computer skills to look at that. And um, one of their main things is looking at EQTL, so, um, associating expression with um, a specific genetic variant. They also have PQTLs, yeah, so protein associations with protein um, and genetic variants. They also have splicing variants. Um, they have allelic expression, which I didn't get into, but looking at the ratio between two different alleles, indicating that there's a cis-acting regulatory variant um, and just overall expression. Um, so there's a, there's a variety of components that are accessible through the database, but then we've also, um, Kate's been a, a, doing most of this, I've downloaded all of the, the raw data from GTEx, and so we can do additional analyses on the raw data. Okay, I, I'm afraid we're out of time. We're a little bit behind, so we can only give 10 minute break, uh, and we reconvene at uh, 10.55. <laughs>